It is in a modern Arabic literature class that I had taken as a sophomore in college, sometime in 2008, that I became fully aware of the limits of referring to one's homeland as a female body, one to be protected and fought for as one would protect their pride and honor, with f forms of attacking it or even worse, stealing and colonizing it, depicted through the gruesome images of rape. It is perhaps then, long before any significant development of my political consciousness, that I became meticulous and very aware of the power of metaphor in our grasp of national reality. Fast forward to December 2011, exactly a year after the officially documented ignition of the Tunisian Revolution on the 17th of December 2010. And I find myself yet again bombarded by poetic images. Though these images were not on pages of a pan-Arab fiction novel, but on very real newspaper headlines and are actually quoting real people. Opinions, a mere two months after the first free elections in Tunisia, loudly claiming that the revolution has been aborted, murdered as a fetus, stolen, and opposing opinions, arguing that one should be patient with the revolution and the state, because we are, Sana'ula Demokratia, literally translating to first grade in democracy. What a long first year it has been, stretching and extending to almost a decade of inaccurate depiction of what is actually taking place in Tunisia, what is happening producing awkward narratives that are loosely owned by anyone. Today, here, I will not claim that I have the correct story of what is happening or what has happened and what is continuing to happen. For the pieces are still being collected and they will forever be readjusted. I will, however, share the narrative that has allowed me to make some sense of the rapid changes, the numerous twists, the diverse actors in my homeland's story. The first thing that I have come to terms with is that Tunisia is not my mom, nor my dad. A homeland should be no one's mother and a state should be no one's father. When you look at your homeland as a parent, your own homeland, you are up for disappointment because you are mainly expecting its love. You're expecting it to know exactly what is going on and to know exactly what it's doing. But what kind of agency does a homeland have? Rejecting this metaphor completely comes from my personal observation that goes beyond pushing for a caregiving state. For personally, I strongly believe in the role of the state in protecting people and in tackling inequalities, for example, and striving for a shared view of social justice. This rejection stems from the role I envision we play as citizens in relation to our homeland, which is a notion that transcends the state or the administration and politics. Many of the loud voices that I've been hearing have been describing Tunisia as the bad parent, neglecting the poor, mismanaging resources, making poor choices in politics and economics, and poor choices with its neighbors, and so on. The image is compelling and the metaphor could be sound, but I believe that there is more to the story than my country being a struggling parent. When your homeland is your child, not your parent, when it is born to your own expectations and hopes, you give it unconditional love and hope that it will one day outlive you. You protect it in every way possible and are always aware that a part of you grows with it. Tunisia, my home, is a newborn. Our country is not a baby, it is our baby. It is the sum of what our expectations and ambitions and perceptions and everything we had hoped for in a homeland 
all of this, what they have given birth to. What we propose as a cord to bring different groups together, what ties us as individuals, and what goes deeper than written legal texts like the Constitution and executive orders. A baby is born into a world that has set standards for what a healthy baby should look like. Its weight, its height, milestones, very specific milestones, are defined to measure their progress as they grow. And though this, he this helps these milestones, they help keep the baby healthy, or they help us keep the health of the baby in check, it can become a source of stress it can fail to capture the differences between one baby and the other. In 2011, the loudest voices were very quick to define the milestones to which we will compare the progress of our homeland of Tunisia as a nation. Those milestones sounded very familiar. In fact, they were universal. Organizing elections, yes, they were delayed by two months, but check, we organized them. Draft a constitution, yes, it was delayed by two years, but check, we did actually vote a constitution in. Organize legislative and presidential elections on time, check. Vote the Financial Act every year, check. Deal with terrorism, check. Pass a number of fundamental laws, check. Establish the constitutional court, oh, a six-year delay and counting. Align the laws with the constitutional principles, such as the penal code, oh, seven year delay and we're counting. Suddenly the milestones stop making sense. Just like a baby actually, our measure of success or progress can be biased by a generic and superficial approach. This does not only fail to reflect the nuances and the reality of things of what actually happens on the ground, but it can be very dangerous as it may conceal dangerous lags Perhaps this could explain the striking difference between how Tunisia is viewed, how it is viewed by different actors that are actually impacting its reality. And it might shed light on why there is an abyss, an enormous abyss, between the concerns of citizens who are outside of the regular power circles, what <laughs> we often call ordinary citizens, and the concerns of decision makers, of politicians. Perhaps this would explain why there is no singular Tunisia, but multiple Tunisias, as perceived, each from her and his own experience and point of view. Think of all of us, citizens giving birth to ideas of homelands on the same land, to each their picture of what Tunisia is, what it was, and in what it should be. The loudest might depict a normal picture of a country that checks all the boxes, just like a normal baby that is respecting all milestones. Peaceful rotation of power players through elections, regular services sustained to a minimum extent, students attending schools, institutions trying their best to provide services given the resources that are available. But there are numerous murmurs of a different picture of a baby that has yet to fully respond to verbal cues from its surroundings. And those cues, if the metaphor actually permits, are the eternal demands for freedom and for dignity. As proud as a parent could be of the progress of their own child, I cannot help but question, do we have the right tools did we, did, we did we provide our child, Tunisia, with the right tools for it to grow into the image that I had dreamt of it to be? A land of freedom and curiosity and justice. No good parent ever questions the abilities of their own child. A good parent always questions their own approach out of utter belief that there's always, always hope and room for improvement. A valid rhetorical question is often raised in Tunisia. What is a decade in the life of a nation? A decade is perhaps the first six months of a baby's life, I would say. A time to build immunity through vaccine or disease. To my Tunisia, education is the vaccine 
violence is the disease. The first six months to a baby are also a time to acquire skills such as verbal and motor and coordination. I believe in Tunisia we can proudly check freedom of speech, a major milestone in a nation, a major verbal skill for a baby. We can definitely do better with the rest. Yes, I am a parent, along with 11 million other parents in Tunisia, but to each their own, to each their own homeland, to each their own Tunisia, and to each their own parenting methods and beliefs.